Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Thursday edition. Getting near the tail end of the week. Almost Friday and, man, nice little meltdown we had in our market today, which is where I'm going to start today's show. I did receive a bunch of comments, questions, and feedback from you guys, so thank you so much for all the feedback, particularly on the YouTube channel. I think I'm, I'm, I'm this close. I'm just this close to breaking 6,000 subscribers. It's crazy to think that it's taking me that long to get 6,000 subscribers. I guess all I'd have to do is, yeah, well... All kinds of ways, I guess, I get more subscribers, but we'll just build it organically. Um, the 4th of April today, here's our graphic to start the show. And again, you know, I, I wanted to come up with, a, I wanted to put the market break begins, but it's not necessarily all market things. Show 895 today, I, I decided to go with the title, The Stock Break Begins. Now, why would I pick that one? Of course, as you know, we've been looking at this one for a while and watching kind of the trajectory of these markets and trying to figure out exactly where they may be headed. And of course, the trend line has been just up and up and up and up and up and up. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't seem to stop. Now, as we know, all trends tend to continue, right? Everything works until it doesn't. Trends tend to continue. That's why we say the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. Well, I had a, um, let me bring up the picture here. This is from, from Kurt. Uh, Kurt sent in this graphic here. Let me bring it up full screen for you guys so you can see it. Um, oh, it's a little blurry. Uh, probably I won't even waste your time with that one because it was just too blurry to do that. But anyway, he sent a picture of it. It looked like a Keltner channel or just a linear regression channel of the S&P 500. And I thought, you know, we've been looking at that same picture for quite some time. It's going to be blurry. I'll, I'll bring you to the real charts here in a second. But this is the, the chart he, he sent us. And you guys know, I, I typically don't put an upward, um, I don't, I'm not so big on channels. I do like the lower trend line because I'm waiting for that break to happen. But in this, you got a great example. It looks like a linear regression channel uh, where it's actually picking that high point as well. I know it's blurry. Don't worry. Don't adjust your camera. It's just the graphic that I have. So I'll go back to, uh, that was from Kurt. And I messaged back to Kurt. I said, you know, well, we may close outside of that today. So let me start with the broader indexes, particularly the S&P and the NASDAQ, which were the real damage points. We, we looked at it yesterday saying, look, it's not the, the end all. It's just a sign of weakness, right? Things are just starting to slow down. Well, you had um, FOMC member uh, from the Minnesota Federal Reserve, Kashkari, came out today. I don't know if you guys saw this one. Kashkari says, you know, if inflation continues to rise like it is right now, we may not make any rate cuts at all this year. And I think that that was one of the comments that the market went, oh, crap, we're not going to get rate cuts this year. And then all of a sudden things started to fall apart. So let me start with the S&P 500, which uh, had, you can see the daily time frame here. That's a pretty convincing break of that trend line. There's no mystery about that one. Of course, we could all speculate as to, should I draw the line differently? Whatever the case may be, that's a pretty significant one. Now, going forward, you know, we've just broken the trend line. That in and of itself does not mean that this trend is over. You, you need to start breaking a pivot or swing low. And then you could argue that, that trend is officially done. And to me, that happens right uh, at 5167. We'll call it 5167. If we break that to the downside, then it's trend is over and mainly, or maybe just start thinking about shorting these markets. Infinitely Fine says, I saw the bend, so this must be the end. <laughs> well, it's definitely bending, right? That's a pretty clear, easy bend on the S&P. But what's more impressive is look at the, the trajectory for today. So I was building content and teaching today so i didn't get a chance to uh to trade like i wanted to i did a little in the, in the opening and then missed the whole afternoon part but you can see let me put a a vertical line on actually let's just do this i will draw a yellow box which i haven't done in a long time i'll put a yellow box on the after hour session just so we can all see what what happened and what transpired so here's one o'clock and we'll go all the way over to uh where we opened up today and let's go back to 6.30, and there you go. So this is, all of this activity in yellow happened in the after hours session. So I'll, I'll move it up so you can see the lows of the after hours, the high of the after hours. It looked great, right? We, we For all intents and purposes, we're gonna have a nice bullish day. We sold off a little bit that opening hour or so, and then rallied, uh, actually almost two hours, rallied back up, and then, well, I'm gonna have to look at my clock, and then just completely fell apart right around 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. So ugly tail end of that day, falling apart. This to me is extremely bad, not only because of the magnitude of it, 
but also the fact that we closed right near session lows and still drifting lower in the after hour session. So to me, very bearish sign, I'm not, not feeling optimistic about this one at all. And you know, I do have some long positions set up right now, which could be troublesome for me. So we'll see how those ones progress over the next couple of days. The question is, does this continue to break? Do we see this continue to slide? And, and that's the, the, you know, the whatever amount of money you wanna put on it, question for your, you and your account. So there's your break of the trend line for the S&P. S&P is coming back down into that swing or pivot low that was from uh, May, March 15th, it's Friday a few weeks back. And we'll see if we break that one. I don't know if we'll break it tomorrow, but it certainly, I think is gonna give it a challenge here. Now, the next one was your NASDAQ. NASDAQ got a more convincing break. We were already showing weakness of that trend line two days ago. We closed below it, closed below it again yesterday. And now similar picture, I do have the 18,000 mark on the NASDAQ 100 futures as kind of that pivot point where there's that potential uh, for it to start making a new pivot low. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's a short them if you got them kind of situation, in my opinion. Now, I saw at the very beginning here, Big Eb, aren't you supposed to be on vacation, buddy? When, when do you leave for vacation, Big Eb? He says a 5% pullback would be healthy for the markets. I would venture to say a little bit more than that. Given the ascent and the rate of ascent that we've had, particularly since October of last year, 5% is a drop in the bucket. That that's, should be unnoticeable. I think more likely a 10% pullback would be healthy for this market and possibly even bigger, allow these markets to regroup and maybe get some more momentum to the upside. However, the, those, um, the dominoes, if you will, and, and on this show, I've, I've tried to do a good point of pointing out the positive dominoes for the markets and those negative dominoes. And the negative ones are starting to pile up a little bit more, in my opinion. I, I may be wrong, but that's just my, my thoughts on the current situation. So, yeah, we had jobs numbers today, too. End of the month, all right. Right as the halving comes, you're just gonna take off and go to Italy right as the halving happens, and hopefully your Bitcoin will surge so you can spend it over in Italy. Okay, so let, let's go back to our NASDAQ chart and we'll dive into some of these other markets as we progress. If the news that, that I think is, is gonna start to grow, which is the inflation piece continues, then I would definitely point my wagers to the south side and the shorting opportunities here. Now. Remember, we have had inflation tick up, and you saw Jerome Powell yesterday at Stanford saying, no, oh, it's okay, you know, it's, it, inflation's bumpy, it happens, uh, we'll be fine, we're gonna meet our 2% target, we'll probably have some rate cuts, I foresee some rate cuts by the end of the year, and I was making the point that this is the same guy that told us it was transient, and it's not gonna be a problem. So, trust factor, not very high for me with our central bankers and Jerome Powell, they're gonna say whatever you wanna hear to calm a situation. The charts are telling us something very different. Now, if you look here, um, I'm gonna map out 10% off of the high. We'll go 10% off the, the all-time high here, which is going back to, let me do snap mode on the NASDAQ 100. That goes back to Thursday, March 21st. And let's just bring it down to where is 10%, all right? I'll do two things because Big Eb said 5%. I'll bring up 5% as well. And we'll do two different uh, metrics here. Oops. So there's your 5%, and I'll do it on the S&P and NASDAQ, since those are the two markets I'll be focusing on, and maybe a little rust along the way. If we were to get a pullback on the NASDAQ 100, which peaked out, again, on the 21st at a high price of 18709 if we get a 5% pullback, that brings us to 17774 right? And that's, that's not too far away. I mean, we're, we're actually almost there, fairly close. If we get the... 10% pullback, which I think is a much more plausible um, scenario here, particularly if that spread, if that fear from the Fed spreads and inflation starts to tick, then you're looking at 16,837. Okay, so those are the two targets for the NASDAQ with, with a 5 and a 10% respectfully. Let's go to the S&P, which of course is the dog that wags the tail, the most important market index in the world. And from the peak we saw just on Monday, which is the all-time high, let's go measure out Big abs 5%, which would put us right around 50.65. Okay, now remember, we peaked out on April 1st at a high price of 53.33. So getting down to um, 50.65 would be a drop of about 160 points or 170 points, sorry, 270. And we're pretty close to that. I think 10% is the more likely outcome. Where would 10% drop us? Well, let me draw my magic eraser on here and get us to 10%, which would bring you down to 4,800. Notice that that would be a nice even round number and also come into this area of demand that we see starting this really big rally here back on January 18th. So 
At this point, if we get a close below 51.67 in the next couple of days, either tomorrow or going into early next week, uh, then I do think you'll see these markets drift even lower, maybe even challenge 4,800 for the S&P. I know people are like, oh, gosh. Now I'm just Kashkari instilled fear in the market today. No need for rate cuts. Yeah, I, but that's... I don't think he instilled fear in the markets. He's speaking the truth. No, didn't we just, we've been discussing this almost every day and I feel bad. I feel like I'm kind of a broken record, but it bears repeating. We, we've been talking about it. The inflation numbers are surging. It, it's clear to see on all the different metrics, everything else seems to be okay. So inflation is still their number one goal. Remember, it's a dual mandate. The Fed is responsible for two things and two things only. They're not responsible for the market to go up. They're not responsible for GDP to improve. They're responsible for stable prices and full employment. Well, stable prices equals inflation. So that's number one of two mandates. And the other part is full employment, which I've made the point. We're at full employment. There's no argument there. We can shelve that one until we get to 4.5% unemployment, which a number comes out this Friday, comes out tomorrow. And we'll see if we spike up. Maybe we get to maybe we get to four percent. But who cares? It's still really low. The only thing that matters, if you're the Federal Reserve right now, the only thing is inflation, because that's your two jobs: jobs and inflation. And inflation starting to surge again. So cutting rates would be foolish. You would actually be going against one of your mandates. So I again, I I think Kashkari did the right thing. It's logical that if, if inflation continues, that they will not be cutting rates this year, if it continues. Now, we also heard Jerome Powell say yesterday at Stanford that uh, he's not making any decisions that are going to be politically motivated. They don't do anything with regards to rates or interest rates based off of political stuff. I, I, I call BS hogwash. I'm pretty sure there's some pressure there. But what can you do, right? If we get that surge up in inflation, you know, you, you got to start raising rates again. And I'm sure that the Biden administration is going to go, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't raise rates again. And I'm sure that the, uh, the opposing party, whoever's the presidential nominee, I think it is, is it still, is it Trump? Is it official that Trump's the, the nominee for the Republicans? They're going to point the fingers and go, oh, see, see what they've done. And it just starts this whole political soap opera over again. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm with Kashkari. I do believe that if we continue to see inflation, that we will not get rate cuts. But I don't think that inflation is going to get as out of hand as some people are forecasting. I think it'll tr trickle up. You know, maybe we get inflation back up to 5 6%, which would be just concerning for a lot of people. But I don't think we'll see that 9 I saw some comments um, from Elon Musk as well talking about much higher inflation coming. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that one. Oh, now when we get a rate hike, that's going to change the conversation, which is why, you know, I... I created the graphic for today's show because it's it's not just oh the stock market is showing weakness right nothing operates off an island in trading you all know that the the markets are not isolated so when i put this graphic up it says the stock break begins and we look at a chart of the s&p 500 which arguably has had three pretty bad days um this doesn't mean the party is over but the probability every day that this drifts lower the odds increase of a bear market. I think you'd all agree with that, right? No one's going to come out here and say, oh, this is it. This is it. Markets are going to go to hell in a handbasket. We're going to crash. 50% market correction coming. No one is saying that. Well, let me rephrase that. There are some extremists out there that will create these sensational market forecasts. But as a trader, I don't care. I don't, if the market were to drop 50% from here, it's the same thing as if it drops 5% over the next couple of weeks. It, I will position myself and ride it accordingly. So uh, I'm not worried if it if this is the beginning of a monster crash, who cares? I need to know how I'm going to position myself in the intermediate term. So this price chart is just telling me, look, the weakness is coming. I've been saying it for a few days now. It's like, oh, maybe we'll see, maybe see a little pullback here. Now the question is how deep, right? If we get deep on this one and break that 5167 mark, which is very close, and let me just measure out what that number would be. That would be a decline of 3.2. 0.3%. Now, come on. How many of you, all right, 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 you type in a chat here. I want, I want responses. How many of you feel that a 3.03% decline in the S&P is something to be nervous about? Is this like, oh God, oh my, 3%. Yes or no? Scary? Uh, what did Noam say? Everyone is gouging the public and blaming inflation. Yep. Oh man, it's bad, Noam. It is really bad. Uh, it's funny because I... 
those of you who know me well know that I I don't want to use the word cheap, but I am very frugal about my decisions and investments and, and just consumption. And if, if I'm not getting a good deal, I'm not buying it. Uh, for example, for anybody here who lives in Southern California and you like Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you need to, after the show today, you need to drive straight to Vaughn's. Vaughn's has $2.42 Ben and Jerry ice creams. For those of you who don't know, that's a $6 pint for $2.42, but you have to use their electronic app on your phone. Right? I mean, you think I loaded up on those? Fridge is full. Got him. Um, yeah, everybody's here. Nope, 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 nope. 3%, no big deal, guys, right? 3%'s no big deal for the market. But I think you would all agree that this may be the beginning of a bigger pullback. We just don't know. So, uh, again, if I look at all the factors out there that are pushing this, inflation is the discussion and interest rates are the two most important things right now. Why Why do I have I done this trading business for so long? Because it's never static. It's always changing. There's always something that's a more important topic for that period of time. And right now, there is no topic greater than inflation and interest rates. Those two go hand in hand. They're married at the hip. And I think that that's going to be the driving piece, at least for the remainder of this year. Now, you add in the drivers for inflation, which I talked about uh, the bond yields. We talked about the dollar index. We talked about commodities. Let's take a peek at what happened with the crude oil today. I mean... Man, um, we had a, 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 a graphic on the screen here that said, look, don't do anything with crude oil until it either tips down below 84.85 or breaks up above 86.20. It did both today. It just tiptoed down below 84.85. And then as that market started to tank, crude oil started to rip. And we saw a nice break on it today. We broke above 86.20, closed at 86.59 on it. Um, you know, my target is 89. I think that 89 is a very real possibility and momentum appears to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, on crude oil. It's just starting to rip. So we've got some very interesting pieces happening. Uh, Next week is maybe something that saves it, right? At this moment, markets look great. We've seen the weakness for the past three days and it's just doing something it hasn't done in seemingly forever, which is make some new lows, right? We're just about there. So we've got a slight pullback on the markets. I did kind of create sensation here with the stock break begins. Yeah, it broke the trend line. And if we look at this in phases, you know, step one, step two, step three type of progress, step one broke broke the trend line, okay? That's step number one. Step number two would be it makes a new low. So we've achieved step one, it broke the trend line. We have not achieved step two yet, which is breaking the low here. That's going to happen if we get below 51.67 on the S&P. Step number three would be that we've come back up and retested an old supply zone. So let's say we, I got too many lines on the screen here, guys. Let me get rid of that. Let's say that we do this, that the chart looks like this. It sells off, it breaks down below here, and now we've achieved step two. We've made a new pivot low. Step three would be that it actually rallies back up test a previous supply zone and then proceeds to make a new low now we are we would be officially in a downtrend and that's not the case yet we're nowhere we're not close to that Uh, and there may be one saving grace that could bail out these markets personally if you leave these markets without any news from here on out for the next couple of weeks we just leave it as is with no updates this market's going to sell off and i think you're going to see it drift lower next friday is when the fun really begins Next Friday, J.P. Morgan, Goldman, uh, Citibank, State Street, uh, BlackRock all report earnings. And that may be that, that piece, that catalyst that the markets are looking for. If the banks are robust and they're showing great profits, and that means economic growth, and, and that may be the case, but um, I'm not going to hang my hat on the, the banks to save it for everybody. Let's see. Ben and Jerry's, please. Hagen dazs baby. You know what's funny, Larry? Every week, the grocery stores put out ads, and I'm a nerd. As soon as the ads come on Tuesday, I look through them and and kind of plan out what I'm going to get for the week. Typically, I go right to the meat section, see if I get tri-tips or New York's on sale, maybe, maybe some uh, primer roast, Uh, and then I'll go right to the desserts and look for ice cream. But yeah, I I like them both, but I got to say Ben & Jerry's is better. You got more unique flavors. It's a bit creamier. Hagen-Dazs is much more dense solid. Well, you know what? Let's start the Trader Merlin ice cream show. We'll call it Ice Cream Merlin. The show is called Cold as Ice. Coming to you next. No, totally making it. Anyway, let's see. What do we got here? <laughs> oh, I'm giddy. I love when markets see what they did today. Uh, if it says you should put Ben and Jerry's in the freezer, it will just melt in the fridge. Trust me. 
I don't. It gets better, I think. Uh, why did Bitcoin follow the trend down? Good question. Um, you know, if you look at the the trend today, it it didn't really follow today, right? If the mark markets are down over one percent, you had the the Russell was down one point zero seven, you had S and P was down one point three, Nasdaq down one point six, and Bitcoin was up three point eight percent today. So I don't know if I would say that's following the market. Now, what is interesting about what's happening with Bitcoin? You guys have seen me talk about this type of pattern before. It feels like you're just consolidating. It feels like price is kind of compressing here. And I'll just draw some some lines across. I'll do two things here. I know we've done this in the past where you kind of go through the tails like this, or I could go through the real body. So there's basically you're, you're looking at compression of price. Okay. Um, I'll go out here a little bit further and I'll go through the bodies and you can see it looks a little bit better if I torture that chart line or trend line to look like this. Oh, come on, Merlin. You gotta love what's on snap mode and I can't get exactly the picture I want. So, you know, you, you could argue that that might be the point to go through. Either way, you're, you're not making higher highs and we're not making lower lows. This is compression. And going into the end of April, which is a very important time for Bitcoin, uh, I don't expect to see any big moves out of here. I think you're gonna see Bitcoin kind of go flat until after the halving incident, which is gonna happen on uh, end of April, May, right around May 1st. So I don't know if it necessarily followed our markets. I think it actually went the opposite way. Um, and I do believe that if the markets crash, or not crash, let's, let's, that's not what the, what's gonna happen. If the markets sell off and have a correction, which I think is very plausible and needed for the market, uh, I think Bitcoin is actually gonna surge. I think money will flow into Bitcoin, and it, particularly with the halving. Remember, supply is gonna get cut in half. The creation of Bitcoin now decreases by 50%. Uh, that's a pretty major thing, and that's gonna happen for four years. And then it gets cut in half again, and then again, and again. Um, the PMI numbers, we can check out those. Yep, let's see. Um, my prediction is pullback for three months and be back up to all-time highs by election. Very plausible, Tibor. Yeah, um, it, it could certainly happen. For, for Tibor's hypothesis to work, though, in, one thing has to happen. Inflation must get under control. If inflation continues to rise, then I would say no way, Tibor. There's not a chance. Inflation is too big, too, too, too looming of a topic. Now, if inflation stays, at, let's say, at 3%, somewhere on there, then, yeah, there's a real possibility we could get uh, all-time highs again. But if inflation ticks up to 5 maybe 6% in the next three months, yeah, we're not hitting all-time highs. Even though it's an election year, right? You're supposed to get that 7% gain for the year. No, nope, not going to happen. Uh, what else did happen here? Hagen dazs Dutch Belgian double chocolate. For me, it's caramel cone. Caramel cone's my favorite Hagen dazs flavor. Uh, milk and cookies is my favorite Ben and Jerry's flavor, along with the Tonight dough. But we all have our own little quirks about ice cream. Um, okay, so I think I covered most pieces here. Let me go to the economic data because that was relevant for today. Um, we had our unemployment claims. So the number for ADP last yesterday was actually pretty decent. Today, unemployment claims ticked up, which not that big of a deal. If you look at some of the, the PMI numbers that came in from around the world, most of them were actually pretty positive. We're starting to see uh, our services PMI numbers were better for most parts of the world, getting better, slight increases, which is a good sign. Now, I'm going to jump the gun here a little bit and go into tomorrow's session. If you look at what happens tomorrow, we have some pretty big announcements. Obviously, the unemployment rate is the big one, and they're expecting that to come out at 3.9%. Now, to further illustrate why I think that this is an irrelevant conversation piece for now, you just, just go back and look at the last 24 years. You know, full employment would be probably, according to the Fed, uh, I believe was 5.5% was what they called full employment, which would be where the horizontal line is right now on your screen. Let me, let me move it over here. That's where they would consider it full employment when we had our huge surge um, of unemployment back in 2010. Now, we're at 3.9. Like I say, if we get to 4.5, which is up here, then I think that the discussion will turn to unemployment as being a major issue. But we have a lot of flexibility here. So even though the unemployment number is a big one, I think the market will uh, overreact to it tomorrow. If we come out of something like 4, which would be, in my opinion, a logical uh, slight step up, even though some of the data has been looking pretty good. Um, if we got to 4%, still no big deal. Now, 
you have average hourly earnings, which is another important one. They're expecting earnings to increase, which is great. Uh, we all want to be making some more money, but that's your kind of your big stuff happening for tomorrow. And then one that most people aren't going to pay attention to too much is this one down here at the bottom, consumer credit. We have witnessed this surge in consumer credit. Uh, there you go. Um, I'm going to go all the way back here into 2000 again. Gee, I wonder what's driving our markets. People had access to cheap, easy money and look at all the credit they were taking. Now, all of a sudden, we saw this really big pullback here in consumer credit. So I'm curious to see uh, what this most recent number comes out as. And are people really being uh, that much more conscious about their spending habits and credit? I I'd like to see what those numbers end up being. But that's going to come out tomorrow at 3 p.m. So uh, markets will still will have one hour left. That's going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, let's see what is all the num says. We need oil back at 60 barrels. Um, I don't know if we need it. We'd like it, right? I would. I mean, I drive a gas vehicle and I don't get the best gas mileage. Would I like to see crude oil down at 60 bucks? Sure. I'd love to see it at 60 bucks. However, remember, we don't control the price of oil. We don't control the price of oil. And it's obviously based off supply and demand is one factor. But then, you know, tensions, issues, drama, that we have with foreign countries can certainly have an impact on that. And I think uh, we would probably have to bend over backwards and go out of our way to accommodate Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, OPEC, um, and give them a lot of concessions to get them to increase their output significantly, which would drop the price of oil significantly. So, Or we'd have to come up with some uh, radical new way of refining, which would create greater efficiencies in our markets. So I don't think we'll see 60 anytime soon. We want $60 oil, but we're probably not going to get it. Now, could could our government put pressure on these countries? Sure. Yeah. We could tell them, hey, we're going to stop giving you a bunch of free money, which which we tend to do to a lot of different countries. Uh, we've done that since I've been listening to any president speak. It's always been, yeah, we're giving this country billions and this country billions and this country billions, but we can't even give our brave soldiers who fight for this country a place to live and they're homeless on the streets with psychological issues yeah different discussion so yeah i would want uh, crude oil to be under 60 bucks but not going to happen i don't think anytime i think the odds are are in our favor of it going up remember now look at that uh price chart the trend is your friend until the bend at the end no one here is going to tell me that that's not an uptrend at least starting from december of last year right y'all are going to agree with that one if you don't agree, we need to get you some glasses because that's an uptrend. Um, same thing when I look at SPY, right? It's, it's an uptrend until it breaks. And we had on the SPY a pretty ominous looking engulfing candle today, uh, which engulfed pretty much a week and a half worth of move. So this isn't over yet, but it's not looking very good for the S&P. You can see the triple Qs looking at a similar picture, right? I've got a bunch of lines on here, but I've, I've kind of mapped out several different stopping points. But that engulfing pattern is just, boom, man. Boy, ugly. Uh, let's go look at another one. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously I'm kicking myself, I and mean, we're not done yet. Remember, I sold the 2350 calls on my SLV today. At one point, you know, we had silver at a high of 2495. I was just like, wow, can't believe it, because I still have quite a bit of SLV uh, in my possession, and obviously I would like to, I'd like to uh, have it close at let's say 2349 on uh, Friday the 19th, but. Uh, we'll see. Got a long time between now and then, but wow, what an Im impressive move up for SLV today, or at least the past week. Today was much higher, but notice the pattern you have today on SLV. For anyone who's looking to buy silver, you may get your chance. All right, you have a little bit of a shooting star here, although granted it's not in the, the best location. It should actually be outside the range of this previous candle. So you have a, uh, a shooting star formation potentially here on SLV. If it gets down below 2439, you may have a shorting opportunity on that one. And GLD got a similar picture, right? So these are definitely due for a pause. They've been just smoking some of the hottest, hottest markets out there right now. If GLD gets down below uh, 211, uh, there may be a shorting opportunity for you on that one as well. And you have some unfilled gaps that have happened on gold as well. So there's your... Your commodity side of things, what we didn't look at today was that 10-year. 10-year not surging. We didn't really see any move up today in that 10-year. Actually, it was a down day, so not, uh, not, not the greatest day for the 10-year. But the dollar index finished with a very long bottoming tail hammer formation. Now, what does that mean? Similar picture. You have the markets are starting to show weakness. That dollar all of a sudden rebounded today. If this dollar rips up tomorrow, which I think it probably will, 
uh, then you'll see continuation of the downside of these equity markets. So keep your eye on that dollar index. That's a pretty important one. I'd argue it's still channeling, even though it did tiptoe above that line that we had there at uh, 104. Maybe we just pop this to 105. Massage it till it fits, right? The story of a trader. 105. So there you go. And maybe that's our, our new level there, 105 even. And yeah, I do think you'll probably see it challenge that 105 here again soon. Now let's see. <clears throat> what did... Uh, what did Adam say? I guess he had, I noticed a pattern every six years, i.e. 2008 housing bubble burst causing recession. 2000 crude oil went negative. Well, that, that was a freak event in 2020. Um, COVID happens if you Fed prints money like no tomorrow. Uh, am I engaging? Well, no, you're not engaging in conspiracy. Look, things happen all the time. There's also a pattern for viruses. It's like every, I think every two years, uh, there's a major virus that comes out. It was avian and then it was swine flu and all. There's these patterns that form in our markets, and um, the real truth to it is, I think that, I think that, when you least expect something, that's when it's going to happen. It's just the black swan principle. And with our markets right now, it feels like a lot of people are just throwing caution to the wind and just buying because these markets have been just screaming since October when Big Eb said markets are going to go to all time highs. And you were right, Big Eb, you nailed that one. Um, I was long for a very small port i was long for this first day of this one <laughs> uh that was a big long position i think i had 80 call options on the nasdaq but uh, i dumped that right before fomc announcement uh, and it just kind of been playing short-term swings for a couple days maybe a week or so ever since i really wish i would have just had a bigger position long and stuck with it but uh misread that one just didn't think we'd see that big of a rally up and out of there so this keeps pressure on keeping prices up uh which part does tom what well, keeps pressure on it? Uh, what else we got here? Probably cook, cook the books and make the market go higher in spite of inflation. I don't know if you can, Oliver. If you keep, if inflation keeps going up and up and up, that people will revolt and just hopefully they revolt and stop buying stuff, stop buying the things they need. Cooking at home, restaurants suffer, businesses suffer, and then you have an economic issue. So it's tough. You can't you can't fight inflation too aggressively, but you have to at a certain point. Otherwise, consumers will stop buying and they won't have enough money to buy the goods and services to support the valuations that the economy has given it. Tricky spot to be in. Okay. Um, let me, real quick, I do want to keep talking about this, but I want to, before I forget, um, Mike, who I think is here today, I think I saw him in chat, uh, he was like, well, I kind of disagree with part of your conversation yesterday about trading from around the world about key loggers. And I showed you a little way that you could potentially, you know, fool a key logger. Now, key logging software is all over the place. It, it, you can have some that are very basic and it's just keystrokes. Um, there are some key loggers that will actually track your mouse. Now, as I mentioned in yesterday's show, I'm not making it where it's impossible for them to crack your password or username i'm trying to make it more difficult for them so if it did record your mouse strokes which i'm not sure that you know they all do um i think that by doing what i showed yesterday which is clicking different places typing in different numbers and letters and variables you're just making it more difficult for them to use as mike pointed out the, the key is just don't use an internet cafe or don't use somebody else's computer period um or or, or an open wireless internet connection that's just bad stuff there Keep a lookout for 2026. I think 2025. I, I, I think this year is going to, we mentioned at the beginning of the year, I thought this year would be really volatile uh, based off of what, what economic issues were facing us. I knew we had the Bitcoin halving coming up. I knew we had an election year. I knew we have interest rates and inflation. So it, it's going to be a very volatile year. But the pain point, in my opinion, is going to come at some, at some period, of, at some point in time. And the main reason I say that is just whenever I look at this chart here, and I've shown this to you countless times, I just I just can't believe that this is going to continue on functioning like it is without a major break. It's just impossible for us to have this kind of growth. And let me go in here and, and um, change this to, I want to go to logarithmic because Tom's here. Oh, this is, this is logarithmic. All right. If I go to a regular chart, it's even more dramatic. So I... I I just feel like there is a big day of reckoning coming for the markets. And you know, maybe that's AI integration and displacement of workers and consumption. I don't know. But um, it, it's going to come at some point. And hopefully I'll be there when it happens. Can you check the probability today for rates? Oh, yeah. So they didn't change. It hasn't been updated yet, SG. If you look here, um, this changed as of, uh, it says it on here somewhere. 
as of uh, 3.51 in the morning Central Time. So this has not been updated yet. This will change tomorrow. It really hasn't changed too much. Uh, this is for the, which meeting? Uh, th I have this for December. So I, I went way out to December. And the general consensus right now is 4.5 to 4.75. And that really hasn't changed much. It's actually kind of increasing a little bit here. But what you're seeing is the, um, the probabilities of fewer rate cuts is starting to become more prevalent in the in the forecast. And I think this whole this whole sequence here will shift um, higher. I think you're going to see this kind of be a um, cash carry statements having traders reset their evaluations of the number of rate cuts for the year. Again, right now this is pro, um, pricing in three rate cuts by the end of the year. This may change to two in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> okay. I think I, got, I think I pretty much got what I wanted to get covered, covered. I talked about, I didn't make any new trades today. I'm just thinking out loud here. I didn't make any new trades today. Uh, updates on some of the stuff I'm in. I saw some interesting things about DJT today. They're talking about the margin required to go short on this one. They've jumped up margin requirements dramatically. But here's DJT. Here's Donald Trump's. We're down 5% today. I'm going to keep watching this one. I was a little bit aggressive, I think, in my call for 18. I think 30 would have been a, a safer bet for me, but uh, I'll still stick with it, Mike. Um, you're at 46.15 right now. We dropped about 5% today. Now, some of the other ones that we've been watching, Arm, still managing to just, just show strength here, even though it, it drifted down a little bit. It's not selling off as much as I thought. I really thought we would kind of see more and more downside move Um consistently here for arm but we had a big pop up a couple weeks back uh, on the 25th of march um, now maybe starting to give some of that back and, and again i have the 100 puts directionally purchased for april or for june third week of june uh what else do we have in there oh my rivian did not do so well today. remember if, if if these markets start to tank you know, you're going to see pressure on a lot of businesses particularly you know automotive this is going to rivian expensive vehicles it's out breaking it's it's low here the low we had back on February 23rd was $10.06, which is why I sold the $10 strikes initially. Uh, right now, I did not sell any new puts. I may actually, we are uh, right now, the low is 10.13. If you scroll back, those are all-time lows. So not looking good price-wise for Rivian. And, and this is something that Elon Musk talked about. He says, look, it's all great to design a car and build a car and get everything up and running, but to get it to a point of efficiency on economy of scale it's you're lucky if you make it and pass that corner and rivian right now looks like they're struggling go ev again uh down uh, more today you had a almost 10 percent slide today 224 it makes me feel great getting out of 280 uh, that, that was nice i wish i got out higher than that but oh well um yeah i this this as i mentioned the very first time could go under could really go under Let's see, what do I got here? Tom says, um, 25 can be great, like 2017 if elections have us returning to better policy, energy broader. Yeah. You know, the tough part there, and we certainly not making this a political show, is it, doesn't, it always seems to me that whoever gets elected, whether it's the donkey or the elephant or someone else, there's will always go, oh, well, this still sucks, and this didn't get fixed, and that doesn't happen, so I'm going to vote for somebody else, and this doesn't happen, this guy's... I don't know. It seems like there's, we'll never get that perfect scenario. It's just, I, I hate to say it, it feels like we're going for the lesser of the evils and who's going to do the least damage to the economy is what I end up thinking about every time we go to these elections. Blue Diesel, what do you think about moon cycles and solar stuff that affects markets? Uh, not my thing. I, I mean, I have no problem if it's something that works for you. You know, I made this point before. If you're using technical analysis and it's working for you, stick with it using fundamental analysis and it's working for you stick with it if you are going to the dog park and watching the pooping patterns of dogs and that's helping you pick your stocks and it's working and you're making money stick with it but i'll be honest i don't think it has anything to do with technical analysis fundamental analysis pooping dogs stars tea leaves or moon cycles none of that stuff i think what was really the most important part there is it's all about your risk management you could literally throw darts at a, at a stock a wall of stock names and pick a stock as long as you have the right money management and observe what the trend is doing, right, to add probability in your favor, I think you'll do okay over time. Um, quite often, the biggest losses that you're going to take are when you're going counter trend and you're just not following the broader market. You guys have witnessed some of the trades I've made. When I take a real flyer and I go real aggressive against counter trend, those end up being the ones that sting the most. They can also be the most profitable if you're on the right one. Um, but yeah, it's uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't really buy into moon cycles or solar stuff. I mean, do I notice? I go to the dog park every day, guys, so that's why I'm using dog park references. Uh, do I notice that that the full moon cycle has a huge impact on dogs and their interaction? Yeah, it's crazy. It's bizarre. Um, it's bizarre how it functions when that full moon is there. Everybody acts differently. The dogs, the tension's way higher. There's much more fighting going on. And maybe that impacts us as well as humans. You know, I always get, oh, Mercury retrograde. One of my really good friends, man, I swear to God. His, he didn't care, care to mark off holidays. It was like Mercury retrograde days. He wouldn't leave the house because electrical stuff would break. But um, bottom line is, it doesn't matter what you use. If it's working, then you need to f stick with that and then refine that process. So again, if you're using lunar moves, cycles, stellar, you know, whatever it is, and it's working, if it is, then great. And then study more and see if you can refine down and make whatever that strategy is even better. To me, that's the essence of trading. Um, don't let somebody convince you that their system is the best and that you've got to use it. You know, there's, there's all kinds of different systems and strategies out there and there's all kinds of people making money, but there is a common thread, at least in my experience, and that is the discipline and the risk management side of it. I've, I've seen people trade crazy, crazy styles, but the risk managers are the ones that end up making money long term. Uh, what do we see here? The market did not like Apple's new robot project. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see Apple's new robot project. I feel like Apple's slowly falling behind in the tech race. It seems crazy to say. Ken Lee says, uh, when you get time, would you give a thought on Jet Zero Corporation? Never looked at them. But let's bring it up. Jet Zero, huh? No, no idea what that is. You got a ticker symbol for me? It's not even showing up over here. I got no jet zero. Nada, not on nothing. Let me just go jet. Jet coin? No. I don't know. You got to let me know. Let me know a little more specifically, and I'll be happy to look at it real quick. <clears throat> I had a crazy dog went crazy the day before earthquake. Uh, you, you know what? Animals will go nuts before earthquakes. I lived out in the country, and all of a sudden, we, in Northern California, you get earthquakes quite a bit. Uh, the horses, the neighbors' horses, would just go nuts, and you're like, "What's going on?" And about 30 seconds later, boom, earthquake, like clockwork. So get a horse. <laughs> okay, I already went through the stuff for tomorrow. Let me just take a peek at that again, so you guys have it fresh in your memory. Earnings, we don't care. There's really not much that's happening with earnings. Uh, we do have a can. I think we have some cannabis stocks reporting. I know that we have. Um, Tilray reporting next week, but it's really about the U.S. markets tomorrow. That's going to be at 8.30 a.m. That's, um, sorry, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. I don't know why this clock changed like this. Let me see if I can fix this. I don't like Eastern times. I like Pacific time because that's where I'm at. So I like, you know, it goes changes to Pacific time. Save settings. All right, there we go. This is going to be way better for me. So I don't have to reverse engineer timing. So one hour before markets open tomorrow, we have not only for Canada, you have their employment change and their unemployment rate which is expected to be 5.9%, slightly higher than the U.S. The U.S. markets have average hourly earnings, non-farm employment change, and then the big daddy for tomorrow will be the unemployment rate, expected to stay at 3.9%. Now, we have had a lot of um, FOMC members speaking, and it, I, I think it's creating a bit more clarity to what the Fed is thinking because most hang their hat on Jerome Powell. You can see tomorrow you've got Barkin speaking as well as Bowman, and they may also give some clarity and create waves. Remember, Kashkari isn't like the number one guy, but he certainly created some waves in our markets um, today, which uh, some of you hopefully capitalized on. I couldn't find out my thoughts that you have. Oh, no, never heard of Jet Zero. I'll, I'll write it down and look at it. Maybe I'll talk about it on tomorrow's show. Um, and that's it. I'm going to wrap up, guys. Wow, a 45-minute show. Pepe, Pepe's usually here giving me a hard time. He says 2024 is the year of the 50-plus-minute shows. Not today, Pepe. We're going for 45. Um, all right. So keep your eye out there for tomorrow. Again, those are key levels that are showing up on the S&P in particular. If we end up breaking down below that 5167 mark, I think that it's going to trigger program selling. I think you'll start to see more people start to sell off here and or more systems sell. Again, so many algorithms out there, and they'll be triggered off these supply and demand zones as well. Uh, oh, yeah, Procter Gamble is one that I was into. So I... Uh, I sold puts on Procter Gamble at 152.50. Totally fine with that. I collected over a buck sixty in uh, in premium, so still still feel good about that one. But it was down today, 0.45 percent. All right. 
that's gonna do it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something. I hope you're all ready. Uh, for those of you who are the short-term day traders, have those short guns ready. There might be some good shorting opportunities, particularly if this starts to trigger more selling pressure. Because right now, people are so excited about market all-time highs, all-time highs, all-time highs. Well, it's like crossing the street in England. Most Americans die because they look the wrong way. Focus on one direction, you put yourself a little bit of a handicap. So focus on both directions. In this case, it looks like the south side may start to be presenting itself. We'll know more as the days progress. So thank you guys so much. For all those of you who are new, hit that subscribe button, share it, like it, subscribe to it, whatever. I'll see you guys on tomorrow's show. Take care, everybody. Oh, 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 oh,